So welcome to the ELD MOOC. Welcome to this afternoon session. Welcome to week nine. Only two weeks to go in our ELD MOOC. And so far, uh, I just looked at the statistics this morning and uh, I have to say we have a very, you all are very active comp also compared to many other MOOCs uh, we uh, know about. So uh, thank you very much for your participation so far and all the thought and the hard work you put into the assignments. I'm currently reviewing uh, the last uh, assignment and hope to get back with feedback uh, this week, uh, so to make sure that you will receive the feedback before you turn in the um, final uh, project. And I have to say, I'm really looking forward to this final project, to the cost-benefit analysis you will present on uh, the land uh, you selected and on the scenarios you have uh, been doing. So I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to May 9, uh, when all the uh, submissions uh, are due. Uh, please note that this is two days earlier uh, than uh, the usual Sunday or Saturday submission. Uh, and that is because we will have to uh, look at the presentations and uh, select the teams that will present uh, their case in uh, the last live event. So uh, that's the last live event. And uh, today I'm very happy to have a distinguished speaker, Dr. Thomas Falk of the University of Marburg, who is a senior research uh, fellow at the University of Marburg, who has extensive experience in economics of land degradation. He will uh, introduce us to his research project on the future Okavango in uh, Botswana, uh, Namibia, and one other country. And I've uh, already seen it's a very long presentation. So uh, without uh, many more words, I'm um, turning over to uh, Dr. Thomas Falk. Please welcome uh, today's uh, speaker with me. Please. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, very good. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that I have the chance to present some of uh, our research from, from our project um, to all of you. And um, yeah, great that so many have joined the meeting still, even though we have a public holiday ahead. And um, what I hope to, uh, to present to you is some kind of alternative approach um, to capture the economics of um, ecosystem services, ecosystem goods. And um, yeah, let's just go ahead and you will see what I'm talking about. Um, but before I start, um, I would like to know what is... Okay, there was something on my computer popping up. Um, um, I just want to know whether some of you have seen the films which we have advertised because um, they give a very good impression of what I'm going to talk about. You will see in these films, uh, on the one hand, how people use natural resources how they um, interact with them, or what kind of benefits they receive. Um, but apart from that, I also want to just very briefly explain to you our approach. Uh, Claudia um, announced that I'm going to tell you uh, something about an, an alternative approach to involve stakeholders. That's not the main, main um, focus of this presentation, but let me let me give you at least one little example of how we um, involve stakeholders in, in our project, and this are in fact these films. What we have done is we, uh, we went to the communities and um, we called in a meeting and we're sitting together with the people and explained to them 
we want to uh, work on the relation between people and nature, and we would like to make a film about it. And um, if they would like to, uh, to do a film with us. And if they agree, then we ask them, so what would you like to show to other people in the community and in other communities uh, with regard to your relation um, to natural resources? And then they came up with some topics. And when we have decided on the topics, um, we asked them again, so what more, uh, more specifically you want to show, what kind of actions, what uh, kind of activities. And then a smaller group, as you can see here on this uh, lower picture, uh, in a kind of workshop, um, really wrote the script of these films. And um, after the scripts have been written, um, the people were even doing the filming themselves, as you can see um, on the top picture here. This is not a, a well-qualified uh, filmmaker who studied filmmaking. This is a community member who is filming here. And then even in the cutting, when the material was uh, all recorded uh, and the film was about to be cut, then um, it was still done in the workshop. So what you see on these films is really the perspective of the community with regard to their um, um, relation to natural resources. And for our project, this was very important because we learned um, what they consider to be important and um, yeah, what, what is it they want to show to other people. And this also had then an impact on where we have been setting priorities with, uh, within our research again. So I just advertised it long enough now, but also the approach. And um, you can, you may now say we, we had one, um, one uh, well-qualified filmmaker who was facilitating the process, but you don't need that necessarily. You can take a normal camera um, if you are more interested in the process and not so much in the product of the film after all. Yeah? So this, uh, for us, very important was the, the process of uh, the film. Um, the Future of Kavango project uh, is researching, as I said, the relation between people and nature um, in the Okavango Basin, which is one of the last nearly pristine uh, aquatic ecosystems on the African continent. Of course, there has also been a lot of transformation, land use transformation taking place, but in comparison to many other river systems, it's uh, still very much intact. And at the same time, we observe that there are numerous uh, developments uh, ongoing. We had a long civil war in Angola People were suffering for more than 30 years um, and a yeah, war, which was a kind of satellite war of the Cold War. So the Americans have been involved and the Russians and the Cubans and the uh, South Africans. And yeah, many people were playing around there uh, or many, many uh, countries, uh, powerful countries by then uh, on the global and the regional scale. And um, as a result, uh, development was kind of hampered there, um, which one can say had to a certain extent benefits for the uh, ecological state um, of this river system. But now, of course, people want to keep up and there are a lot of developments which um, are also a threat to the, to the ecosystem. And just to give some examples, there are plans to expand, really massively expand irrigated agriculture in, in the basin and building large water reservoirs. Um, but at the same time, there are also cross-country nature conservation um, um, approaches implemented. Some of you might have heard about the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. This is a huge conservation project which covers Angola, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And so also this needs to be taken into account. 
So what I want to present to you today is um, part of our work, which is dealing with the perceptions of people with regard to outcomes of such future development. And um, we want to know in particular also whether there are differences with regard to these perceptions uh, between users, natural resource users, up and downstream of the river. Um, before we start, I want to go back um, briefly to the question of uh, why do we so often use money as, um, as a unit in, in the quantification of uh, the value of natural resources? Um, this is an approach, actually, this monetarization is very often also criticized, in particular by, I experience it very often uh, amongst natural scientists within our project or outside of our project. Um, yeah, many people kind of are uneasy with money. It's, it's, not, just, uh, it's not just a means, uh, there is some uh, emotional attachment to, to money. It uh, kind of symbolizes capitalism and it symbolizes um, um, this uh, materialization of uh, values which uh, some people consider are beyond this uh, material uh, value. Okay. And I want to really have a look at it uh, as unemotional as possible and uh, try to go back to the functions of, uh, of money. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, different categorizations of these functions and I took a very simple one. And first of all, in the, from the perspective of an institutional economist as I am, money as a function to make exchange easier. So if you have one good and the other person has another good, then you don't need to um, establish the relative prices between each of the goods uh, for all good combinations, but you only have to establish a price uh, to this tool, the money, which you use for exchange. And the other um, function is the storing uh, of capital. So if I'm, for instance, somebody who is producing milk um, and uh, I am now selling my milk, uh, but I also want to do some long-term investments and I somehow need to store uh, what I get uh, from my product and milk or eggs or yeah, most of the food products we have are not so suitable for this. So we uh, have something to store for. But what is most interesting in uh, the context of economics of land degradation is that money is a unit of accounting. Yeah? And I refer here to, to Hayek, who said that it reduces the transaction costs of comparing the relative prices of goods. And why is this so important with regard to economics of land degradation? If we look at alternative land use options, then we want to know what are the trade-offs between alternative options. And very often the outcomes of alternative options are very multidimensional. And it is very difficult to uh, compare the different dimensions with each other. So how do you actually compare the spiritual value of a forest with, for instance, the uh, uh, foot produced by a factory, which alternatively could be uh, uh, built at a spot or uh, a plantation. So actually, this is, first of all, very difficult to compare. And what we are doing now to bring it on one scale, we, we give both of them a monetary value for the food. It's not so difficult because we have markets. But uh, for the spiritual value, then we have different approaches, as you have learned also during the course. And um, yeah, so now you can bring it on one scale, and then you can say, no, if we uh, if we do this option, then we are losing this. 
uh, and have only this benefit or the other way. So I'm coming back to this because actually I want to present to you an approach where we do not use money as accounting unit. Um, and uh, there may be cases where um, putting everything, every value uh, into money is very difficult and um, takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And sometimes there are easier approaches in order to compare alternative options. And I want to present to you um, one of these approaches. And I could imagine that there are for some of you interesting as well. So, so what is the underlying assumption? Um, don't be afraid. I have only a little, little bit of theory here, even though I see already that something is not so perfect here on the slide. But anyway, um, so the, the main assumption is uh, related to our approach that if people uh, compare alternative options, then they develop preferences, what they like more and what they like less. So in our approach, I very often tell our participants in the experiment, it's like uh, if you compare uh, a, a Coke with a Fanta, um, so there is no right or wrong, it's just what you, what you like more or less. And then um, like a basic assumption of uh, economics is that the preferences are linked to the utility which we perceive to receive from an option. So the higher my utility I'm receiving from a good, the higher is my preference for the good. It sounds very, um, yeah, very simple um, and uh, yeah, take it as well. Um, another very important uh, assumption which is related to what, we are, uh, what I want to show you is that um, the utility is a linear function of utility password utilities, uh, like utility aspects. So if you have two shoes, then um, the shoe has to have different colors and they have different, uh, they are more comfortable and they have different prices. So, and I attach to each of these attributes uh, a certain utility value. And if I add them up, then I know what is my overall utility of, uh, for the different shoes and I can compare them with each other. This is simplified and there are also a lot of, uh, um, yeah, one can criticize this and one can discuss this, but this is what we kind of assume here. Now, what I applied uh, is called a conjoint measurement approach. Um, and what we are doing is evaluating local resource users preferences for hypothetical uh, development scenarios. And out of these uh, preferences, which we receive from the people, and you will see how we are doing it, um, one can estimate path years, path worth utility values for the de different development outcomes. So different aspects of outcomes which are linked to development scenarios. And um, these uh, pathways utility values can then be associated to potential development pathways um, as well as to possible future development. So, so this allows us to compare uh, trade-offs between scenarios, between development outcomes um, without having to monitorize the outcome. And uh, it allows us then to draw conclusions about the relative importance of, of these outcomes. So as we said, uh, we are working in the, um, in the uh, Kavango Basin. Here is a picture of it. Um, it starts, uh, um, the catchment starts in the um, highlands of Angola and then more and more water joins. Uh, the river follows for some time the Namibian Angolan border before at the end it um, uh, drowns in the desert in Botswana in the famous Okavango Delta and if, every, if anybody of you has a chance to visit the Delta for me it is one of the 
most beautiful, most fascinating um, natural habitats um, and, and landscapes. Uh, I have seen a lot of wildlife, and um, yeah, you can do do um, game walks there, and you really get in touch with nature there. I, I really love it. And um, we have different sites in uh, the catchment, and I present you data which we have collected close to the delta in Saronga, Botswana, and uh, a bit further upstream in Mashara in, in Namibia. And uh, we also just recently, I just came back from a trip to Angola where I collected data further upstream, um, but I still don't have these data available, so I can't present them to you. So now the first step, if you want to do a, a conjoint uh, measurement approach, is that you really need to get the most relevant development outcomes right. So what is it that can be associated with uh, potential development process? So and here we uh, collected uh, or we, we reviewed uh, great literature, policy documents, um, a lot of uh, project reports, but what was also very important is that we did uh, workshops with uh, resource users, but now with actually with multiple stakeholders. So there also have been people from the administration, from line ministries, from NGOs, traditional authorities. On the picture there in the back, you see the uniforms of the traditional authorities in Angola. Um, so during um, these workshops, together with our review of available literature, we identified the most relevant development outcomes. And in our case, these are um, changes with, re with regard to the grazing quality, um, then changes with regard to water quality and quantity, um, with regard to employment opportunities, then uh, the proportion of land which is used as forest compared to um, the, the land which is used um, as field, and development of wildlife numbers, and uh, public infrastructure development in terms of schools and clinics. Now, and as you see here on the slide, uh, we have um, many pictures which uh, illustrate these different outcomes. And this is already an important part of our approach because we showed these pictures to um, our participants in the experiment, in the conjoint experiment. And um, actually combined them. But before we combined them, it was important. And here's just an example. You don't necessarily need to read it. It's just an example. Um, as you have seen uh, on the slide before, let me go back again. Uh, we, for each of the attributes, how we call them, of the um, development outcomes, we have two um, alternative, um, does that work? We have two alternative um, attribute levels, yeah, or outcome levels. So here you see for instance, uh, I tried the, the later pointer here. You see that um, there are less wildlife numbers. You don't have elephants in the area. While here on the other picture, on the second picture, you see that there are more elephants. Yeah? And here, um, there on top, you see there is more forest and less fields compared to on the other picture, uh, less forest and more fields. So, and now this more or less, you need to somehow for the approach to um, to make more concrete to to specify, and here is just the example for the employment attribute. We we knew how many people are living in the settlement. Uh, we are researching. We knew from surveys how many people are employed, and now we give them two alternative scenarios, which are associated to the two pictures. The pictures are just the illustrations. So, in the one option is. Uh, employment opportunities remain on the same level as today. This means that 215 people are employed out of 3,200 inhabitants of the surrounding villages. And the second um, option is that employment opportunities improve so that 250 people out of 3,200 inhabitants are having a job in the private or public sector. 
So you see the, the change we include here is not so big. It's just a, a small one, but it actually is also important to consider when you design a conjoint uh, design that um, the attribute levels should be in the range of what is indeed realistically uh, possible to happen in a certain period of time or yeah, depends on um, um, what you look. So, and now, as I said, we combine these pictures. Yeah, so the different attributes. And um, we, you can imagine we have six attributes with two attribute levels. This means actually that there are uh, 36 possible combinations, but you can keep it simpler in uh, calculating um, uh, fractional orthogonal design. Um, which still allows you to make statements about uh, each of the attributes. And therefore, we um, um, did only eight combinations of the, um, um, of the different uh, outcomes. And as you can see here, you have on the top card, you have, um, you have more wildlife, but poor water quality, better grazing, a lot of forest, less uh, less fields. People are having more jobs, but no public infrastructure. On the lower picture, you have better water, less uh, wildlife, and so on. Yeah. So this is basically what we did with the car. And then, as you can see on this picture, um, our respondents had to rate, rate, rank. No, not rate, but rank, rank um, the eight combinations. Bring them into an order. Um, um, bring them into an order, and um, out of this ranking, this uh, preference order, we can then calculate um, the utility, the perceived utility of the respondent, of each respondent with regard to each attribute and each attribute level. So, and here we um, already can can get a little bit to the re to the results. How then the results of this approach look like? And what you can see here on this figure is um, a little bit the the, the figure got um, got spoiled uh, when we trans uh, transformed it here, but uh, not not that bad. Um, so what you can see, both in Botswana and in Namibia, people are very much concerned about the water quality. Yeah, this was actually a surprise to us because we thought that, for instance, employment is much more important. Employment is not unimportant, yeah, but um, um, it is compared to the uh, perceptions with regard to the water, it is rather, uh, rather low. Yeah. Um, so you see public infrastructure, pasture quality, and, and employment is on both sides um, then following the water. And uh, the wildlife, which you see down here, now we need to check whether I can, you see here is, uh, this is a relation um, of the forest compared to, to the fields yeah, here as well. And um, now we have a lot of uh, these uh, stars here. And here is the wildlife. This is the wildlife. So these two are actually perceived not to be so important. And I will come back to the forest example in particular a little bit later. Now, what we expected actually, uh, what we hoped for, um, is that we can now link these individual um, preference values to some attributes of our participants. So like, for instance, we knew the main water source of people. Um, and now we, we were looking for a co correlation between the main source of water and uh, the preferences for, for water quality. And as you see on this picture, you don't see anything. There is indeed on at both sides no significant um, difference between 
the preference values for water um, between the two groups um, who have who mainly use river water and uh, compared to the to the people who uh, mainly use tap water or borehole water. So oh, this this was a surprise to us. Um, Another example is here with regard to livestock ownership. We expected, obviously, and everybody probably would, that um, if you if uh, you own livestock, then you have a higher preference for for good grazing quality. But again, the same picture as with, with regard to the water. Um, there are no significant differences um, with regard to the grazing uh, quality preferences between livestock owners and non-livestock owners. So this, this is already something very interesting from a theoretical point of view, um, because, um, yeah, modern economic uh, theories would assume that um, the preferences depend on the context and depend on, yeah, um, your, your social economic background. And this is something we cannot observe. So this goes rather back to more, more classical economic uh, theories, which uh, assume that uh, preferences are more static and are less context specific. I would not uh, go that far that uh, we have to go back to all the theories, but I just want to show you that we were struggling here with this. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, by showing you some, some uh, income figures. We uh, have done an extensive survey, and in the survey, we uh, learned uh, how the uh, income of the household is composed. And what you can see here, the largest uh, share of the community household uh, of the community income, sorry, of the community income um, is uh, salary income, which makes 33% in the media. But at the same time, you have to be aware that only 12% of uh, the community members actually have a salary. So this means the moment you have a salary, your income in the community really increases tremendously. So that uh, then if you count this all together, it makes up a large share of the overall uh, community income. So surprising that the income, uh, that the salary uh, or employment uh, attribute was not given, given a higher preference uh, in our order. What you can see that uh, looking at the natural resource um, uh, income attributes, so this is here, the harvest value, the forest, and then the river value. You see that the, the value of river resources people receive is, um, is the highest with 15% uh, of the overall household income or community income, um, then followed by uh, cultivation. So the crops people grow, and then the forest is even lower. Now well, this kind of explains at least the order um, um, of the attributes related to uh, the natural resources. Um, even though livestock, as you can see here, which was actually uh, having a higher value as well, is also not so so strongly perceived, not not, not so strongly uh, uh, contributing to the income. So if we take out the uh, the employment income, then you see that the, the proportions remain the same and the river um, resources even uh, contribute uh, even more to the overall household budget. So let's look at Botswana. Here it's even more pronounced. Even the, the salary income uh, makes up even a larger share in Botswana and our, at our Botswana side approximately 33%. No, no, 25% um, of the household or of the household members um, receive some salary income. And you see that what they receive uh, uh, proportionally from natural resources is even smaller than in Namibia. 
The structure is uh, also a little bit uh, different compared to Namibia. If you uh, look at the, only the households who don't have salary income, here is now business income all of a sudden much more, much more pronounced. The natural resources are still yeah, important, not unimportant, but uh, um, not as strong as, for instance, in Namibia or as other income sources. So what can you do if we go back to um, our conjoint uh, results? What can you do with the results? So you want to learn something about uh, different subgroups uh, within the community. And what we have done with um, our preference values, with our utility values, we have calculated clusters, um, doing a cluster analysis. And what you can see that in the media, you have a relatively large group in the community which has a strong preference for um, water, yeah, for uh, high water quality. Um, these are approximately uh, yeah, almost half of our sample. And then you see smaller, smaller groups. You see that the, the uh, preferences are not homogeneous within the community, very important. This is something which is hidden if you only look at the, at the means. And um, you can see, for instance, here that uh, there is a smaller group which has a high preference for better developed public infrastructure. Then there is a smaller group which is more concerned about post pasture quality. Um, then two groups, actually, two smaller groups who are looking uh, in particular, employment, improved employment opportunities. And, um, and this one group, this cluster five, also um, concerned about uh, more land to be being transformed into, into uh, uh, fields. Um, now, obviously, we could easily imagine um, hypothesis how how uh, or whom we find in these different groups. So cluster one may be, for instance, people with children who are supposed to go to, uh, to school or elder people who are more concerned about uh, health infrastructure. And cluster two would be the livestock owners and so on. But as I told you earlier, unfortunately, we don't find these, these correlations. This is something which still puzzles us. Um, let's look at the same picture, at the same uh, clusters uh, for Botswana. Um, and you see here that there are actually even two larger groups who are very much concerned about water. But we also have relatively big groups uh, who are then more indifferent. Yeah? Cluster three and five. Um, they are the different attributes are close together, even though cluster three is most concerned about public infrastructure and cluster five most concerned about um, the pasture quality. So, yeah, this is uh, more or less where we stand at the moment with regard to these analysis. And um, what this helps us is. Um, when we also communicate to, to uh, policy makers and decision makers who um, Olga ask, how do, we, um, how do we define the clusters? Um, um, we did a cluster analysis. Yeah? So out of our conjoint approach, we get utility values for each um, for each of the attributes, each of the outcomes, development outcomes, and the, in particular, the levels of the development outcomes, so the high and the low level. And um, we did a cluster analysis with these um, um, passwords utility values. And then what you get is uh, groups where the values for the different attributes are as close as possible together. Yeah? So you get a cluster where, um, which is as homogeneous, homogeneous as possible. Um, which means, for instance, here in the Botswana case, where you have a, you have a cluster, a group of people where um, um, 
everybody had a very high preference for the water. Okay? So this is more or less how, how we did it. Um, now, what did I want to say next? Um, yes, I, I was talking about the, um, the um, value with regard to supporting decision makers. Now, you don't really get uh, a monetary value for different development outcomes. So you cannot say that uh, having a better pasture is worth as many millions uh, of money dollar compared to, for instance, uh, making a plantation there or whatever. But you can tell decision makers that the people on the local level, um, they, uh, are very much concerned about water quality. And this is actually something very, very uh, uh, crucial in uh, the context of our study, because many developments have a strong potential to um, really decrease the quality and the quantity of the water there. And uh, many policymakers and also local business people argue, yeah, but people are mainly concerned about jobs and they want to improve their income and this is uh, what is most important. But what we can see as just one outcome of, of our research is people are very much concerned about the water quality. They strongly depend on the water and even those who don't take their main drinking water from the river um, are very much concerned about the water. Yeah. Okay, um, I wanted to quickly go back to the one example which I touched already, which is the trade-off between forest and uh, field. Yeah, making more fields compared to um, clearing the forest. So the the main um, the main activity which uh, leads to deforestation and to also land degradation in these uh, in our research area is uh, clearing forest for, for field. And now we look only at Namibia, and as you can see, the income people receive from forest resources, this is the total uh, harvesting value. It includes all the resources, including um, the stuff which is consumed only in the household. So it's not only what they are selling, it's uh, including the subsistence income. Is It is lower than the, um, the value what they receive from their crop. So this might explain why they actually are not so much concerned about the forest. Let's look a little bit deeper into it. In our research area, um, there is a deforestation uh, dynamic which started only in the 70s, 80s. On this picture, you see um, the, the, the colored uh, dots here are the field in 1984. I picked out just one area uh, of our research uh, site. Yeah. And you see there are not so many fields. In 1984, the, the forest, everything is, which is white here is actually forest. Yeah. And um, in 1984, there was hardly any land clear. If you now look at uh, the time series, you see how over the years, more and more fields have been cleared. And don't get confused about the green color. Green means here, uh, or any color here on this picture means that uh, this are fields, this are fields cleared. And you see that until 2008, really quite immense uh, area has been cleared. And you, you see that this is really a very, very recent development this uh, land degradation, which is taking place here. And I'm, I'm calling it land degradation because in the area we are researching, the soil fertility decreases very, very fast. And people use one, one field for not a maximum of five years. Yeah, most of the people leave a field already after three years because the soil fertility uh, goes down so quickly that they don't get a proper harvest. And then what is left, um, there are bushes growing and bush encroachment is one of the most uh, um, common land degradation forms in Namibia. You have 
really uh, thorny bushes growing on these old fields and you can use the fields not even um, as grazing, no animals get through there. This, this area is then really spoiled for quite a long period of time. So what we did now, we, we kind of uh, wanted to understand this, uh, this uh, rationality a little bit better. And if you uh, compare the revenues that people receive from one hectare, if they cultivate it in the first year, and compare it to uh, the benefit, including the subsistence benefit, which they receive from forest, then you see that what they get from, from the field is much more compared to what they get uh, as direct use values. It's only about direct use values at this point. But we consider that the direct use values are what most directly affects uh, their decisions, their clearing decisions. So the direct use values are much lower than what they get from the field. Now you can, of course, argue, okay, but this is only a very static look at it. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Jesse, you are right. The population increased since 84. Um, I have a figure, uh, but I don't think I have it in the presentation. Um, but what you need to take into account, there are different de uh, developments. Actually, in 84, a lot of refugees came from Angola again to Namibia. Um, but then later, the population decreased again after the civil war uh, finished, but still you have an increase. It plays a role. The population increase plays a role, without a doubt. But um, if you want to explain the strong deforestation rate or uh, yeah, the, the clearing of new fields, then you need to take into account another very important aspect, which is um, that new infrastructure has been built, new roads have been built, uh, large areas of this forest could not be used in the past because um, there was no water. And there have been a lot of boreholes drilled also in more remote areas, which make it now possible to use, um, to use uh, this forest areas. And this also very strongly, apart from the population dynamics, um, um, affected the uh, deforestation. Okay, let's go back to uh, the example with the uh, um, with the fields compared to uh, the forest. Of course, you cannot look only at uh, one year uh, period, because uh, as I said, the um, the fertility of the field decreases quickly, as you can see here in the first column. Let me see whether I can show this. Yeah, so here you see how the fertility goes down and therefore the income of the field. Um, while what you receive from the forest is constant, yeah, this doesn't really change. And if you now look at the cumulative um, revenues you can get from the forest compared uh, to using one hectare as a field, then you can see that after approximately 20 years, there is um, uh, um, um, how do you call it again? I mean, there's a, like a break even here, where then all of a sudden, in, in long term perspective, the forest gives you more income than the uh, um, than the field if you if you use the, the hectare as a field. Okay. Um, I come back to this question a little bit later because um, um, I want to finish this example first quickly. Um, so here I more or less uh, try to uh, visualize um, the table which I gave you here. So what you can see down here is that the field gives you a good income at the beginning, but this income quickly decreases. So here are the accumulated incomes where you can see that uh, the um, marginal utility decreases quickly. Um, the forest income is more or less stable. And, uh, but if you uh, consider uh, uh, time preferences, which means that people are 
uh, valuing uh, today's benefits higher than future benefits, then you see um, yeah, that at one point the uh, uh, forest income is, uh, is uh, um, overtaking the income from the, from the forest producer. Um, now, in fact, we assumed here a relatively low um, discount factor for the time preferences, which might be unrealistic. If you actually increase it, it's only a 5% discount rate, which is very low. If you actually uh, increase the discount rate to only 10%, then you will see that the picture already looks much different and uh, the, um, the break even point is reached only at a much later stage. So if you look only at the at the uh, uh, direct use value, you can see that in fact it makes kind of sense for the local people to clear the forest. Okay. So I, I'm stating this because um, very often when we do these economic analysis, we we enter the analysis already with the assumption that indeed it makes sense to uh, not clear the forest. From the local perspective here, I would say, um, even though we did not include some other values like spiritual values, which are important, definitely, but there is a high likelihood in this case that from uh, the perception, from the perspective of the local land users, of a local land user, it makes actually sense here. Now, you can look, of course, at other benefits. You can look at what kind of carbon is this forest story and what is the value for tourists and so on. But this means we need to look at um, how we get benefits other people are receiving um, to be taken into account by local land users. So you, you will most probably not find a solution for the deforestation in our area by only looking at, um, at the local perspective. So let me quickly draw some conclusions before, before we can start um, um, before we can start with uh, uh, some discussion. Um, we observe in our research that there are high preferences for good water quality and quantity both in Namibia and Botswana. So this supports wise water use policies and should be considered in the planning for instance, of large-scale irrigation projects. As you can see here on this picture, this is a typical irrigation, the way of irrigation in, in the area where we are working. And as you can imagine, um, this kind of irrigation uh, causes a lot of evaporation, a lot of waste of water, and leads to a strong salination of the soil as well. So one approach uh, probably should be then to look at more wise water uh, use technology. Yeah. What we also observe is that in particular um, outcomes of development scenarios which are more associated with trade-offs um, are, are perceived to be less important for uh, valuing future development. And we also observe that the direct use values and uh, resource dependency can very often not explain um, the preferences for development. And this is actually where I would like to stop. Uh, I think I talked already very long, longer than actually Claudia wanted me to talk. And um, yeah, I thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for this uh, great presentation on uh, Okavango, on how to integrate stakeholders and uh, how to interpret uh, the results uh, and communicate them uh, to uh, policymakers. Thank you. That was really a great uh, presentation. I hope so that you enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope you learned something. Okay, uh, we'll uh, take some of the questions uh, from the chat itself. There was one from Mr. Kunutur Srinavasa from India. 
uh, whether there is no, uh, not another better option to encroach upon forest and uh, deprive uh, wildlife. I do not fully understand the question. Um, is the question with regard to a better option to measure the trade-offs or an alternative uh, option how to manage forests in forest life? We would have to ask Mr. Kunotur to uh, add to that. So let me take another question first. And there's one by Andrew Quilombo uh, on the ownership um, of land, the political situation in Namibia and uh, blacks and whites. And he's writing, whites occupied the largest and most fertile parts of land. Um, to what extent uh, do you think this could have played a role in deforestation? Okay. Um, actually, we don't have in the media um, the same situation as in Zimbabwe, where indeed the white uh, um, occupies the most fertile areas. Um, the north of Namibia uh, receives uh, the biggest rainfall of the country. And this is actually where the so-called native reserves uh, or yeah, the, the biggest native reserves have been established in Namibia. One reason why they have been established there is not because they wanted to give the best soils to, to the black population, uh, but rather because uh, in the north uh, there is a lot of malaria and a lot of survivors have been passing away from malaria, so they kept away from the malaria. Um, the, the area we are talking about is communal land for, for um, at least 100 years. Yeah? So um, I think the, the, um, the reserves have been established in the early 20th century. What you are, of course, uh, pointing at, which is very, very much right, is that we have communal land ownership here. So officially, the start is um the the owner of the land and it's you supposed to be used by the communities so you have a social dilemma here you have a you have a, a common pool resource uh, a dilemma here because the forest is used by everybody of the community while the fields are private ownership so if you clear a piece of forest um it means that um you only lose the small, the small portion of what you are using from the forest, um, but you gain everything you get from the field. But at the same time, when you clear forest, then everybody else in the community is also losing. Yeah? So you have a, a typical common pool resource dilemma, and we are actually uh, researching this dilemma recently uh, uh, with some uh, common pool resource experiments. Um, a colleague of mine is currently um, out there and carrying out these experiments, and we we are really looking forward to see what comes what comes out of this. Okay, there was one question by Antonia about uh, what is the basis for uh, your research design using twenty years of uh, study and a five percent discount rate. Mm -hmm. um, Antonia, the, uh, the 20 years uh, is just the break-even point um, where the accumulated um, revenues from the forest uh, um, exceed the accumulated um, revenues you get from the field. And the discount rate is arbitrarily set. Yeah? I Just for illustration to you. As I said, uh, if you take a more realistic, a little bit higher discount rate, then actually there, there will be a break-even point only much later in time. And by then, you might um, expect that these bush-encroached areas uh, will, again, also develop something which uh, has a nature, which, which also creates some benefits for the community. So this is just to to show you the logic of the thinking. Yeah, this is very arbitrary. 
Okay, uh, we would have now time to take some of your questions uh, via audio. Uh, I'm going to pull up the slide that tell you how to uh, do the audio. If you want to uh, talk and uh, raise your hands, uh, you will have to uh, use the little raise your hands button in the upper left uh, corner. I see Soraya from India has already um, uh, raised his hand. Others may do so, ask a question to uh, Dr. Falk. Um, we'll, no. um, so raise your hand if you want to uh, talk. Otherwise, I would have some more questions for, uh, for Thomas Falk. Um, Anybody who wants to ask a question, otherwise, I okay. There's one uh, for Antonia. Um, uh, please, Antonia, unmute your microphone. Click on that little red microphone next to your name, and then we should be able to hear you. Hello. Hello. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Damas. Hello. Yes, I, I can hear you. I'm not sure whether I hear two people, but okay, yes. Uh, Mr. Hello. Thomas, what is the rainfall of your uh, study again? Hello. I yes. think I hear Surya. Please. Uh, yeah, 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 myself. Okay, yeah, you, you are Surya. Uh, and I uh, think uh, Antonia uh, uh, also put uh, your mic on. Okay, we should not get confused. Yes, Surya, please. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, okay, okay, overlapping. Please uh, okay. respond to Mr. Antonia. Um, and Antonia switched your mic off. Julia, please, please talk. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Thomas, what is the rainfall of uh, your study area? Um, the rainfall Hello. of the study area Hello. is between 350 okay. and 600 millimeters. The further south you go, the less rainfall. So it's a relatively okay. dry area. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any water harvesting structures in that area? Hello. I didn't get the question. Uh, do you have any water harvesting structures in your uh, area? Um, we, are monitoring, we are monitoring uh, climate data in the area. I and we also we also monitor um, the river um, the river flow. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 We would have Antonia. Um, can we unmute? Yeah. Uh, Antonia, hello. Please. Yes, yeah. I hear. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Hear. Uh, I. I'd like to know how did you do the split samples and did you use Tata? Uh, and how was the uh, income effect? Um, how we split the samples? What do you mean how we split the, the clusters? Yes. Um, are you know more more specifically interested in the specifications of the cluster analysis? Yes, and uh, since you're using conjoint like uh, eight combinations, so yeah. you had to split uh, the samples like uh, into eight clusters or no, 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 like that. This is oh. not exactly. Oh, maybe I didn't let my make myself well understood. The, the eight card um, is what the participants had to put into an order. So you have to say each card basically represents a development scenario. And um, now our respondents had to say which of the scenarios they like most and which uh, is the second most preferred, the third most preferred. So then we had an order of the eight um, of the uh, of the eight development scenarios, and out of this order, and actually there is a tool in SPSS, which uh, but basically what is done is 
you calculate an OLS a regression ah. um, out of this order. And um, with, uh, with the regression, you get then pass those utility values for each of the attribute levels. Um, from there on, normally I use data, but data does not have a very good conjoint uh, tool. Um, oh. That's why I have to use for the uh, specific uh, conjoint analysis uh, SPSS. But then if I look at correlations and um, um, any causalities, then I'm working with with, uh, with starter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did that more Thank you up? very much. If you have more specific questions, then maybe we should discuss it later. Yeah. yeah? Thank you. Okay. Okay. There was. I'm taking a last question here uh, by Mr. Kunotur from India. Uh, what is the extent of biodiversity and density in the area? Um, oh, no, no, now you asked me for indicators. Um, we have a lot of natural scientists in our project, and um, they uh, collected many indicators, but I don't have them uh, um, just uh, ready to, to give to you. Um, it is uh, a very interesting area as uh, it is the, at the edge um, of Nyombo woodland. And um, you, you have some specific uh, um, um, plant species there, which you will not find easily elsewhere. Um, if it comes to, uh, to wildlife, you have some areas uh, where you have a lot of wildlife, especially further away from the river in the remoter area um, in Namibia. Yeah, we're talking about Namibia now. But closer to the to the river, you hardly get any any large mammals anymore. It's different in Botswana, our Botswana side. There you have a very, very big uh, human wildlife conflict. And I tell you, I was just walking around my hut uh, to get into my room at night. And then it was probably not more than 15 meters away that I heard the elephant, which I haven't seen before. But that's quite scary. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Falk. Thank you for this, uh, these uh, answers to all the questions. Those of you who want to ask more questions, please stay online. Uh, we'll be online for a couple of more minutes. Thank you. Uh, I will have to announce next week's speaker. Uh, next, week, next week we'll have Louise Baker from the United Nations Convention to Combat Desert Desertification here in Bonn. And uh, she will talk uh, about uh, how, uh, how to mobilize resources uh, for this project, how to um, increase uh, participation. So she'll be sharing her experiences and I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you all online then again. And now comes the fun part. Switch on your webcams. Uh, we'd love to see you all uh, now via webcam. Um, we'll switch them on. So I see webcams coming on. I see Antonia. Hello. I see Navneet, my German-speaking friend from India. <laughs> uh, Andrew, hello. 